Hello everyone, this is Lord Kernan, and I am back with Game 5 of the King of Kings GT. It was a 2,000 point Kings of War tournament that took place at the Guns of August convention in August of 2015. And um, yeah, at this point of the tournament, I'm sitting on table 1. Um, I have a pretty good lead in terms of both victory points scored for best general and for total battle points scored. Um, as long as I don't get zeroed in this last game, and as long as my the guy in second place does not get a 20, then um, then I win the GT overall. Um, I think I also was pretty close to locking up most battle points as well. Um, regardless, I was in a pretty good position, um, but there was something weird about the matchups in this tournament. Instead of like what you expect at a normal Warhammer GT, um, where you match people up based on battle points. This GT, they ba they based it off of the most points killed. So they put the killiest armies facing off against each other and see how they do, um, which is cool, and it made for some very interesting games. The problem it led to, though, is for this last game, I'm in first place, and the guy I'm not playing the guy in second place overall. I'm playing a guy who I think his battle points score puts him in fourth place, but he has the next highest total number of points killed. Um, so yeah, it's kind of an interesting, like a different type of situation where normally on table one, your last round, you're playing for the tournament and whoever wins that, um, you know, that can swing the overall outcome of the, of the entire GT. Um, instead for this, he's sitting next to me on table two. And as long as either he doesn't get 20 or I don't get zeroed, um, you know, there's, then I win overall, and he really can't do anything about my game. So, rather than a normal GT, where if he crushes me, he wins overall, um, he's got to hope that my opponent crushes me instead. So, it led to a little bit of a different dynamic. Not sure exactly if I like that, especially for the last round, um, but what can you do? That's how they did it. So, for this game, the scenario was kill and pillage. This is a combination of the game that we played round three, where you place the D3 plus four counters, um, but in this game, those counters are worth 200 victory points, and those can swing um, the victory points. So you add those 200 points per counter to the total number of points that you kill. person with more gets the win, and then you adjust from there based on who killed more. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting scenario. And I was playing, like I said, the guy who's in fourth place on total battle points, and he was taking Kingdoms of Men, so let's jump into it. So here's my list, if you haven't seen it before. I had a Lesser Abyssal Horde with the Crushing Strength bonus item. I also had an Abyssal Fiend with Fly and the Elite item. I then had two Hellhound troops and two Gargoyle troops. I also had a Moloch Horde with another Abyssal Fiend with Fly and three Flamebearer troops. And finally, I had a Tortured Souls Horde. So my opponent's Kingdoms of Men army, he had a Pikeman Horde. Um, this is the same unit that my opponent took in the Game 4. Uh, they have Ensnare, they're minus one to hit. They also have Phalanx and their defense four. So if you go into the front of them, they're pretty hard to shake. Pretty good nerve, I think they're nerve 21, 23. Um, so yeah, they're pretty hard to shake if you go into them in the front. Ensnare doesn't work to the flank though, so the big trick about them is I need to try to get them in the flank. So we'll see how well I can do that. He also had a War Beast with a Ballista, which is, uh, I think that's what it's called. It's basically like a big mammoth thing with a Ballista. Gets one shot, hits on fives, uh, but has Blast D3. So if it ends up hitting, it can do a good, good amount of damage. He also had a General on a Griffin and a Trebuchet. He also had a Berserker Horde. Um, my opponent last game also had one of these. These are the guys with a large number of attacks. Um, I think he also gave them plus one to hit, so they're hitting on twos with like 35 attacks or something. That's a pretty solid unit, pretty punchy. He, with them, with their slots, he took a General on a Griffin and tre another Trebuchet. He then had a Knight's Regiment with another General on a Griffin, and he had an Archer Horde with another Trebuchet. So he's kind of got a pseudo-gun line with three flying characters dancing around. Um, same thing with last game. The flying characters don't pack that much of a punch, but they're maneuverable, and if they get into the flank, they can still do a good amount of damage. So you need to try to contain them and uh, try to avoid the shooting as best I can. So we'll see how well I go into that. So we roll for tokens, and I think we roll... Uh, two. So we're placing six tokens. There's six tokens across the board. My opponent gets to place first, or no, we place seven tokens. Regardless, my opponent gets to place first, and he drops all four in one corner of the board. I spread mine around a little bit, kind of towards the middle. His logic was, if he places the his four in the corner of the board, um, that gives him the opportunity to castle. 
So then he can just cast it on the corner. I got to come to him then. Um, otherwise, he wins based on tokens. Um, and he'll get an easy win in the scenario. So we place the tokens and he roll. we roll for sides and I win the roll for sides. So his idea of placing the four tokens in one corner so he can castle around a hill backfired and now I get that table side and I can sit in that corner. So I pick that side, he's kind of left here. He has the one token in front of that impassable terrain but otherwise he is nowhere near any tokens. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But because it is still a combination of kill and pillage, he... Um, because it's still that combination, he still decides to castle, figuring he, if I, if he forces me to come to him, um, you know, to get the kill points, get the victory points, then, um, I'll have to jump, march into his gun lines. So, we'll see how well castling works in Kings of War, see, see how easy or hard it is to break one of these. Oh, wait, there we go. So I'll go over his deployment. On, going left to right, he has his archer horde. A little bit in front of them, he has his pikemen. Um, behind them, he has his first Pegasus Rider and his um, War Beast with a ballista. Back of the board edge behind his archers, he has all three of his trebuchets angled to get maximum view. Um, a little bit behind and angled, completing the castle formation from his pikemen is his berserkers. In front of them is his unit of knights, and flanking the knights, he has his two Pegasus Riders. So lined up against him, um, rather than going middle of the board, I because he I knew he was kind of going to castle in this corner once he started dropping stuff, I decided to, to put most of my force over here as well. So I have, going left to right, near these tokens in the middle, I have my three units of flame bearers. Behind the flame bearers, I have my Moloch, or my tw uh, lower abyssal horde. In the woods, where I like to put them, I have my Moloch horde. Behind them, I have my first abyssal fiend. Behind the Abyssal Fiend, then, I have my first unit of Gargoyles. Next to the Tortured Souls, I have my Molochs. Behind them is my second Abyssal Fiend. A little bit to the rear and to the right of the Abyssal Fiend is my second unit of Gargoyles. And then over here, kind of middle-ish of the board, I have my two units of Dogs. So we roll for first turn. <coughs> Excuse me. We roll for first turn, and he wins it. So he starts off by jumping up here. Um, those dice represent the arc of sight of my Moloch, so he was sure to jump out of sight of my Moloch so I can't charge him early. His goal is to try to claim some of these tokens to get some points from that and punch through the easy points that are represented there by my um, flame bearers. So they're out of, out of charge arc, which is a smart plan. Over here then, he moves his knights up and around the impassable to face off and square towards my battle line. Offer some charges if I start to advance, advance too aggressively. So there's that. That was a good plan. You know, there's another shot of that. His, his last Pegasus guy jumped back uh, to keep his War Mammoth and his Berserkers in Inspiring. Not really necessary right now, but not a bad idea anyway. Um, he's got a good position on the board where he can kind of get anywhere he needs to, depending upon where I push. So it's a good reactionary force there. We go to shooting, and um, between his archers and his trebuchets, I think one of his trebuchets hit, and then his archers did a good number of wounds. Did six wounds to this unit of um, flame bearers and was able to drop them. So there's that. So we go into my turn, my first turn. He made a big, big mistake with his knights here. Um, he didn't check their arc and didn't check with my range from my abyssal fiend or my dogs. I was able to easily get all three of those units out of the arc. I mean, even if, I mean, I had inch, I had several inches to spare there with that. So I put them there. Um, it's impossible for him to get um, to get out of range with me because I have way more range. And then to compensate for that, um, for the fact that he could get out of my arc if he advances full steam, but to compensate for that, I marched up my Molochs. So my Molochs are just out of his charge range. He is, he is a charge range of 16, and I am like 16 and a half inches away from that unit of um, cavalry. So if he advances far enough to get out of my arc, he's going to eat a charge from my Molochs, which is bad. And if he sits there, he's going to get an eat a charge from my Abyssal Fiend and my dogs, which is equally bad. So he just threw away that unit, um, which I'm pretty happy about. Otherwise, my Tortured Souls just kind of pivoted and faced towards his characters to kind of offer a counter charge. Um, both for anything advancing towards me and um, 
offer some counter charge on his characters depending upon where they go. Otherwise, one unit of gargoyles jumped on that other token, the other one wheeled, so that if his characters advance around the building, I can charge them with the gargoyles. Gargoyles don't pack that much of a punch, but it will be enough to where he'll have to control which way he's facing. If I get a flank or a rear, it's possible I do enough wounds to drop one of them. So there's that. The Abyssal Fiend also turned to face there, and he's positioned to make sure that I have as much as I can in my Inspiring Mark. But I'm still covering a lot of the board um, if he advances his flying characters around that hill. So there is that. Yeah, there's just a better picture of the board. Uh, shooting phase, both of my, he was in shooting range of both my units of flame bears. I didn't have to move them, so I have 16 shots, um, hitting on fours, wounding on fours. I roll a little hot, and I end up doing seven wounds to this guy and wavering him. So there was that. I was pretty happy about that. A um, little bit of luck here early, which I will take. So we go to his turn one. His griffin rider that can move advances there. He is out of view of my... Uh, flame bears, but with his current position and where the hill is, he can't charge me either. Um, his center line is to the flank of my flame bears is being blocked, so I'm fine with him being there. If he wants to putz around where he can't charge anything, I'm perfectly cool with that. The other one obviously stayed still because he is um, wavered. Over here, he just wheeled, um, realizing he can't get those unit of knights out of danger. Um, he just kind of pivoted in the face. He also moved up his uh, Berserkers a little bit. They are in range where if I charge into his Knights, he can counter charge me, but I think he forgot that one of the optional reforms that you can do in Kings of War is after you charge, if you wipe the unit, you can elect to back up D3 inches. So he put it so he is exactly the right distance away. If I back up one inch, I'm out of his charge range again. So I think that was an oversight on his part, um, something we're all a little adjusting to Kings of War, and he... He didn't see that, so getting helped out by a couple of uh, minor mistakes here, but you know, mistakes in any war game, especially at a, a top table, can can really bite you. His Griffin moved up behind that impassable. I can't, um, I can't charge him. But if I charge one of my, if I charge my Abyssal Fiend over and into his Berserkers, he can counter charge. Um, or if I overrun, he'll be able to counter charge me with his Pegasus in the flank. So pretty good position there, kind of controlling where I can go with my units. Yep, there is that. Shooting, once again, claims another unit of flame bearers, which is fair enough. Their nerve is pretty low and their defense is really low, so I'm not really that surprised that he's dropping these units. I just really don't care that much. Otherwise, um, his the stuff that could shoot at my general, or at my one abyssal fiend, didn't hit, so I was lucky there. And so we go to my turn two. So yeah, I pile in. Um, I send my, one, my abyssal fiend and my one unit of dogs in. Um, yeah, the other unit of dogs. I couldn't fit all three units in there, and Kings of War corner charges do not count as contact for the purposes of attacking. So, since the dogs are five wide, I can't get more than two guys in there. I sent my Abyssal Fiend. The other unit of, of uh, dogs, Hellhounds, uh, sits back a little bit behind the, like, a little bit to the um, far side of the other unit of dogs um, to offer some counter charges into his Berserkers in my next turn. Otherwise, the Molochs continue advancing and get around the board now. I'm kind of boxing in all of his units of infantry here that are using the impassable for protection. If he advances at all, um, the Molochs are going to have a flank. Tortured Souls also advance a little bit. They move to a position where they have Arc of Sight on his, um, on his general, on a griffin. And otherwise, yeah, the one unit of Gargoyles moves up to this token, looking at the flank of that griffin rider. Idea is I just kind of want to flush him out. Um, if he sits there, he's going to eat a flank charge from either the Molochs or the um, or the Gargoyles. And if he moves anywhere, he's in risk of getting charged. So um, kind of have that guy cornered. He basically has to retreat if he wants to keep him alive. The other unit of Gargoyles, I really don't need them right now, so they're just kind of sitting on that token. I mean, why not? What else am I going to do? Abyssal Fiend also really didn't move over here. We go to shooting. Um, his nerve is 14-16. I do another couple wounds um, with my Abyssal Fiends. I think he's up to 11 now, so I need a 5 twice, and I roll it. And um, despite his inspiring, his Griffin Rider drops, so that was good. And then here, yeah, I did I did a ton of wounds to his Knights and um, wiped them, even with inspiring. Back both my units up D3, so now I am out of charge range of his Berserkers, so that was nice. So we go to his turn 3. 
And yeah, like I expected, um, with his um, Griffin Rider that was behind the hill, he's kind of forced to retreat now. He's got nowhere to go. We're also going to eat a lot of counter charges and get taken off. So in order to save points and hope, hope to use him later in the game, um, he just retreats him. So they're just outside of 20 inches away from my gargoyles now. These guys, um, yeah, so he didn't advance anything else. Oh. He also wheeled his archers a little bit so they could shoot at the Molochs, which is a pretty good call. Molochs are pretty weak against shooting, so he's hoping to take that unit off. Over here, his um, war beast advance, or pivots and kind of moves so he can shoot at my Abyssal Fiend. He's able to hit um, the Abyssal Fiend. None of the trebuchets can see my Abyssal Fiend. I purposely placed him there behind the impassable uh, when I charged in. I made sure he's in a position... Uh, before I declared the charge to make sure that he can avoid the shots of the trebuchets. So he can, none of the trebuchets can see, but his um, ballista can because he moves, so he is able to hit, does one wound to me, which isn't that big a deal. Over here, um, his ballist, his trebuchets can now see this unit of Moloch since they are height 2, and he's able to land a couple of hits. I think he does 6 wounds, but he isn't enough to break me. So we go to my turn 3. And now I start pushing. Um, with his griffin retreating now, I'm not worried about him. So the gargoyles move up to the other token. The abyssal fiend comes over here to threaten ch flank charges on his archers. Um, or I'm also in charge range of his pikemen. The one unit of furies that was in the back of the board advanced all the way up. So that kind of baiting a charge from his pikemen. I'm hoping to give myself a flank charge. And the lower abyssals advance through the flame bearers behind the gargoyles, so that if he goes into my gargoyles, they can counter charge easily. Flame bearers just kind of move and pivot to go take and go sit on that token, and otherwise shoot at his uh, general on the griffin. Tortured souls move up to the edge of the woods. Uh, Molochs move, continue moving around. Um, once again, so that you can see the counter charges that I'm setting up here. If he bites and goes after the furies or the Gargoyles, rather, um, he's in for a world of pain for counter charges. Otherwise, my Molochs are in charge range of his pikemen. He is not in charge range of me. Um, you measure from the center for distances. So my center is within 10 inches of him. His center is not within 10 inches of me. So even if he sits there, he's not in great sh great shape. Um, Molochs are also, or the Tortured Souls are also in charge range of his pikemen. So he um, really doesn't have many options or any options there with that unit of pikemen. The Abyssal Fiend did not charge, he just kind of pivoted, so once again, if he advances with his pikemen, I get some counter charges. Both unit of dogs charge into his berserkers as well on the back of the board. I figure why not? Um, it's a whole lot of attacks. I won't probably won't break them, and he'll get a counter charge with his um, with his Griffin Rider, but it'll tie up those berserkers for at least another turn, um, give me plenty of time to deal with his pikemen and his archers before I have to go face down uh, the, the berserkers, which are much, much more punchy than anything else he has on the table. Um, and, you know, I might get lucky. I might skew high with the two units of dogs. It is 30 attacks. Um, and I might be able to do a good amount of damage. So we'll see how that goes. There's just a picture of that. And that. Yeah, apparently got a lot of pictures of that. So after combat, I ended up doing 10 wounds to the Berserkers. That's about what I expected. Um... It's actually a little bit low, lower than what I was expecting. Um, 30 attacks, hitting on 4s, wounding on 2s. I should have done around 12. I only did 10. Wasn't able to break them or waver them because he's within inspiring range. Uh, so I just bounce off, and those dogs are probably dead, but what can you do? We go to his turn 4. And yeah, he charges his archers into the gargoyles. I'm perfectly cool with that. Um, they're a sacrificial unit anyway. They die in a stiff breeze. So um, it doesn't matter what he charges with into the gargoyles. The gargoyles are probably dead anyway. Um, so they charge there. Otherwise, in order to prevent flank charges, he moves his pikemen up. So that he's facing down my Molochs. And if I, when I charge into his pikemen now, the uh, Abyssal Fiend, Molochs, and Tortured Souls will all be in the front. So pretty good move there. He charges his Berserkers into one unit of dogs. He charges his Griffin Rider into the flank of the other one. And he shovels his... Um, he just sidesteps his Mammoth so that he can shoot at my uh, Abyssal Fiend again. Shooting, though. Trebuchet is hit. Again, they do another handful of wounds, and he's able to break my Molochs, despite um, Inspiring being right there. I think they were on really low. I think there was like a 4 or a 3. So it's not that surprising. Like I said, they don't handle shooting very well. So those guys are dead. Um, over here, he kills the one unit of dogs um, pretty easily with the Berserkers, as expected. 
The other unit of dogs, though, um, he rolls the break check and he rolls snake eyes, um, which I mean, or he might, he might not have rolled snake eyes, but regardless, he didn't break me, um, didn't waver me, so now I can, I'm free to counter charge and hold up that griffin again, which is pretty awesome. So we go to my turn four, and yeah, the dogs counter charge because why not? There's really nothing else that can be useful doing. I guess I could have been able to charge into his berserkers, but yeah, I mean, probably in retrospect, that's better call, but, because I mean, I have a decent chance of breaking the Berserkers, but I didn't, I charged into this guy, um, what can you do? Here, um, yeah, so I charge my Molochs, in, or my Tortured Souls, into the Pikemen in the front, I charge my One Abyssal Fiend into the front as well, they're not going to do too much damage, he is, um, Phalanx, and Ensnare, so that's going to take a little bit of the bite off of my charge, but something he didn't see, when he turned like that, and then when he reformed his archers after combat, um, he gave me an easy flank charge from my Blue Abyssal Fiend into the flank of his pikemen. So he didn't see that. Um, big oversight on his part. And it's going to cost him. Uh, because that guy's in the flank, there's a really good chance that I break that pikeman unit now. These um, lower abyssals just charge into the archers because why not? I don't see really anything else to do with them now. And this unit of Gargoyles advances full 20 to get the trebuchets into charge range. Yep. So, <laughs> getting help by dice uh, by these dogs. These dogs have been really lucky with nerve checks all tournament. So, I charge in. I do like one or two wounds. I'm not Thunderous Charge anymore because he char it's a counter charge. Um, I do like one or two wounds, which is enough to force a nerve check. So I roll my nerve check and I roll box cars. So now his guy is wavered. He can't do anything next turn. Um... Which is pretty awesome. Really lucky for me. It doesn't play a huge part of the game, but it's just got to be frustrating for my opponent to just have that guy sitting there and not be able to do anything aside from reform. Combat, yeah, as expected, between the two Abyssal Fiends and the Tortured Souls, I drop this unit of Pikemen and I reform to face the rest of his army. And then here, uh, I do 11 wounds to his unit. Their nerve, like 20 22. I don't roll high enough to break him, um, but I do waver him, so he can't counter charge me. Not like the counter charge would do that much to my tortured souls. They are archers; they struggle to fight their way out of a paper bag. But regardless, he can't counter charge me, so that unit is safe, uh, which is nice. Go to my opponent's turn five. He charges. He, my abyssal fiend here was just in charge arc of his mammoth, so he charges in there. Um, yeah, and then here he charges his Berserkers into the flank of my dogs. Probably take those guys off now. They already have five wounds on them, so. His other Griffin Rider swings around and is lining up to claim one of the tokens on the other side of the board. Um, probably a good call. It just gives him a little extra points. I probably won the game anyway, but it'll at least bring something back. Probably more points than he could get if he charged anything with him. There's that. So yeah, he does indeed kill my dogs and uh, reforms to face the rest of my army. So now we're going to have a bit of a clash around this piece of impassable. The Mammoth did a couple wounds to my Abyssal Fiend, but not enough to kill me, so there's that. We go to my turn five. Um, I charge my one unit of Gargoyles into the one Trebuchet. My Abyssal Fiend goes into the other Trebuchet. Those should both be pretty easy wounds, um, pretty easy kills for both of those units, so that's good. These guys pile back into the Archers. So at this point of the game, it's turn five. I'm thinking about uh, the tokens for the objective. My... I have turn six. I should kill this unit this turn. Um, and then for combat reform, I have the opportunity to back up D3 inches. If I back up two or three inches, I'm within the range of one of the tokens. So that's my plan with them right now. Uh, they'll be able to kill this unit, back up D3 inches, and claim the token in my turn six. These guys just move over here to claim that token, um, because why not? For combat here, I charge my Abyssal... My Abyssal Fiend goes back into the Mammoth, and the Tortured Souls go into his flank, so I should take off the Mammoth now, which is good. And then, yeah, like expected, um, he already had 11 wounds on him. I did another handful of wounds and was able to break the Archers, I was able to, and then I was able to back up D3 inches. So those guys are sitting on that token now, so I'll be claiming that one as well. And I killed the Mammoth in combat. And uh, both the Trebuchets. So we go to his turn 6. This guy flies all the way over to claim this token. Just a little bit extra points, because why not? He sends his Griffin Rider and his Berserkers into the Tortured Souls. That should be a pretty easy kill for him. They're, like I said, the Berserkers are really, really punchy, so that shouldn't be a big problem for him. 
And it wasn't. Um, he's able to kill the Tortured Souls, and he reforms. So this is a position where he is not in a great position. He really doesn't have good options. Um, I have the... He basically has one Abyssal Fiend on one side, and on the other side of them he has the other Abyssal Fiend. So it's impossible for him to avoid either two flank charges or a rear charge and a, fl and a front charge. So he just moves to face the uh, blue t the blue Abyssal Fiend to give me some choices. Um, if I charge into his Griffin Rider with my red Abyssal Fiend, um, there's not a great chance that my blue one will break the Berserkers, so it'll just keep a couple of his points alive, which is a pretty good call. So we go to my turn six, and uh, yeah, I don't fall for the trap. I don't go after the Griffin. I send my, my Red Abyssal Fiend into the rear, and the blue one into the front of those Berserkers. That should be enough to take care of that unit, especially since they already have ten wounds on them. And I send the Gargoyles into the remaining Trebuchet. And after combats, I'm able to kill the Trebuchet and the Berserkers. So end of the game, it ends up being an 18-1, um, which is a good result for me. Uh, I could have just played it safe and taken the tournament win by well, once we rolled for sides and I had the side with four tokens. That's a 15-5 to me, and if I win 15-5, I'm not getting zeroed. So that <laughs> would lock up the tournament for me, but I didn't want to do that. Um, I'm not going to a tournament just to win. I'm going to a tournament also to have fun. So I had enough of a buffer. I figured if things start going south, I should be able to salvage a minor loss, and um, that would be enough to lock me up in the tournament anyway. So I decided to push. was able to get an 18-2 here. Um, which was good, which was enough to put me as the overall champion of the uh, tournament. So I ended up with 94 battle points. I missed four points game one, one point game two, and then two points game three or game five. So that was that would be the six points. Oh, I also got uh, bonus points for painting. Everyone got some painting points. So after painting was attributed and best best sports votes um, were added in. I ended up with 94 battle points, which is pretty good. I killed a total of 9370 victory points out of a possible 10,000, so uh, my army was pretty killy. It was pretty effective. Um, about the tournament as a whole, great, well run. Todd did a great job uh, running it. The Guns of August convention is the same uh, group of people that put on my the Swedish comp tournament in February that I posted reports for where I, I took fourth with my monocorn demons um, so yeah it's a great venue great location it's right in the hotel there's a good bar right by it's next to an Outback Steakhouse great great convention I really enjoyed it and uh, really enjoyed this Kings of War uh, tournament to switch it up so if you have the opportunity to go to, to, go to any of the Guns of August conventions um, I'm sure we'll be running another either Kings of War or Ninth Age tournament in February and then again in August uh, next year. If you have an opportunity to go, I cannot recommend it enough. It'll be on Wargamers USA um, forum for all the res all the details about that when it gets closer. So anyway, that's the tournament report. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will catch you guys next time. Have a good one.